Zach Riley reporting from Houston that uh, all is quiet in mission control in Houston as they wait anxiously for the word from the moon. Word that uh, should come in about uh, 19 minutes from now if all has gone well. Our simulation shows the spacecraft over the far side of the moon, which has is now being seen by the fourth, fifth, and sixth human beings ever to make this journey. The first three were, of course, on Apollo 8 in December, the first men ever to peer down on that far side of the moon. The far side of the moon has been photographed, of course, by uh, Soviet and American lunar orbiters, but the Frank Borman crew of Apollo 8 were the first men to actually look at it, and now here are Tom Stafford, John Young, and Eugene Cernan having that look as well. We hope it's a peaceful look for them, that all is going well with them. Bruce Morton, down at the Mann Spacecraft Center in Houston, I've been talking about Apollo 8. How, how does this lunar operation differ from the one we saw on Apollo 8? Well, Walter, I think the main difference uh, is this question of safety that we've all been talking about, and uh, that centers around the fact that, as we heard John Young say a while back, uh, Apollo 8 didn't have a lamb, didn't have a lunar module, so that uh, when they were going through all these maneuvers, their service propulsion system, that big 20,000 pounds of thrust rocket that we've been seeing, just absolutely had to work. If it had failed completely, they still had the one safety factor, of course, of being on a trajectory that would bring them back to Earth, but if it had started and then stopped too quickly, they could really have been stuck. And that's just not true this time. Uh, we've been talking, you have, Nelson Benton has, Bill Stout has, about all of the different combinations that can be worked here, and there really is no, uh, no point here at which the failure of one engine can prejudice this flight. Uh, if the service propulsion system engine doesn't work, you can use uh, the descent engine on the lunar module, and that will get you back in an Earth trajectory, or that will get you back in a lunar orbit. Uh, even after the limb separates, there are a lot of possibilities for playing one engine off against the other. The, uh, Command and service module can go down and get the lamb if the lamb has trouble getting back. And there's, re there's really no point at which you can look at one of these engines and say, that's it. Uh, that, of course, won't be true next time with Apollo 11. Uh, once you're down on the surface of the moon, the ascent engine really does have to lift you off. But this time, there, there are a lot of built-in safety factors that, uh, despite the, the confidence that everybody here had in 8 when it went, uh, just weren't present uh, that time around. Walter? Uh, Bruce, there, there, is that, uh, there is that one point where uh, there's only one engine, no redundancy, and that's in that final burn of the service propulsion system engine to get back into the uh, trans-Earth trajectory, is there not? There is, Walter, except that, uh, as I understand it, if you knew in advance that you were going to have a service propulsion problem, you could come back and uh, perhaps dock with the whole lamb and then use the descent stage to, oh. uh, to get you out of lunar orbit. That's yeah, a question of having some advance warning. But there is that point on, uh, on uh, uh, late Thursday, early Friday, when they send that, uh, late Thursday, when they send that uh, sent stage on, uh, on its way, orbiting around the moon on its own path, and uh, after that, it's too late to use that engine. Well, that's true. Yeah. The other thing I think about these things is that, as Nelson said, they really are very reliable. You can have a problem, I suppose, in the feed lines. You could have a problem with the valves, although there's always a backup set of those. But once you get the fuel and the oxidizer in there, they've almost got to burn. Yeah, right. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Well, we've got another 17 minutes to wait if all has gone well on that far side of the moon before we know that it has gone well and that the flight of Apollo 10 is going as well around the moon as it has gone around the Earth and on the way to the moon. Unless something has gone wrong and they have not fired the engines and then we'll know that in about five minutes when they come around again. With me here in our CBS News Space Center is uh, Arthur C. Clarke and for Many years, long before we dreamed that man would be going to the moon, that I dreamed that man would be going to the moon in, uh, in our lifetime, he was dreaming of it and even predicting it in his great science fiction pieces. And it's just uh, done the, the uh, screenplay for 2001, in which you visualize rather exotic moon travel in the future. Uh, Arthur, 
on the flight of Apollo 11, and now on this flight, we're going to learn a great deal from these fellows, of course, uh, about what goes on. But the Apollo 11 flight, they are really preparing the way for dress rehearsal to get the Apollo 11 successfully landed on the moon. Man's going to get out, walk around, pick up some of this space rock or moon rock. What if you were at the, that first, and you may be, that first debriefing of the Apollo 11 crew, what would you ask? What, what's the first question you'd want to know? Well, that's a... <laughs> well, I... Be glad to be home, I guess. <laughs> but you probably know that by now. Well, then you can take your... Let's take your place right along with all their other television interviewers. I thought you'd have something special. Incidentally, there's a, there's a competition to start in a British Sunday newspaper. What should be the first words that they speak when they stand on the moon? That's a... What should the very first sentence uttered by a human being on the moon be? Crime and ninny. I don't know. What would you say? Well, I only hope it isn't help. <laughs> oh, well, well that, that's a rather black bit of humor. I hope not, too, Arthur. Uh, what, what, what are the things that, uh, that uh, as, as a science fiction writer and a uh, scientist in this sense, in your own right, uh, the, the, what is the most important thing about oh. their finding on the moon? The, perhaps the most important thing we hope to get from the landing is confidence that we can operate and even do simple things like walking around, picking things up. It's not easy under lunar gravity where you weigh, have only a sixth of your normal weight, where you're wearing a suit which restricts your movement. It's not easy to do a, a, apparently simple things like picking up a stone on the ground. They have to develop special tools. And really the mission, they're only going to be outside the spacecraft for, I think, two hours two altogether on this first mission. But the, the main thing is to prove it can be done and to build up confidence that there are no unexpected problems like sinking into the ground more than they expect. Um, there are many things which you, you, you have to learn that you can do these things. And once you've learned that, then you can be much more ambitious. Do you uh, uh, have any slightest thought that there is any life form on the moon? I think it's very unlikely. There's a much greater possibility that there may be the complex organic compounds which were the precursors of life these may exist on the moon perhaps a, a few feet down beneath the surface but it's possible that there are life forms that exist there we think that there are uh, life forms on earth which might survive if they got to the moon so if the moon's uh, climate was ever more benign than it is now say a few billion years ago and if life ever got started there or if it got splashed off from earth onto moon by meteorites that hit the earth and sort of splash bits of our oceans onto the moon, and it may still have survived a few feet underground where the temperature is not too extreme and where there may be moisture and chemicals necessary for life. It's unlikely, but it's possible. This, of course, would be a very low form of life, uh, well, not intelligent life. Uh, yes, uh, probably not intelligent life. But it need, it need not be a low in the biological sense. It might be pretty sophisticated to have adapted itself to that environment. What about the concern that some uh, scientists have shown around the world, and indeed our own people are showing, about the astronauts bringing back uh, some, uh, a, a bug, a yeah. virus of some kind from, from the moon. Yes, the, the question of uh, back contamination. It's, it's very unlikely, but they are taking precautions against this. It's hard to know what precautions are adequate when you're, one deals with a very improbable event, which, if it does occur, may be very disastrous. You're multiplying an enormously large number by a very small number. How much money should one invest into this um, quarantine arrangement? And um, well, Now, the intention is, in case uh, some of our audience doesn't know, when they come back, they're going to be quarantined. The equipment is all built. They're going to be uh, put into quarantine as soon as they get out of the spacecraft and kept in the quarantine. That same uh, quarantine capsule is going to be transported with them right on back to Houston, and they'll be in it for uh, 18 Tw days. 21 days. 21 days, yes. yeah, total uh, time before the landing is confidence that we can operate and even do simple things, walking around, picking things up. It's not easy under lunar gravity where you weigh have only a sixth of your normal weight, when you're wearing a suit which restricts your movement. It's not easy to do a, a, apparently simple things like picking up a stone on the ground. They have to develop special tools. And really, the mission, they're only going to be outside the spacecraft for, I think, two hours altogether on this first mission. But the, the main thing is to prove it can be done and to build up confidence that there are no unexpected problems like sinking into the ground more than they expect. Um, 
there are many things which you, you, you have to learn that you can do these things. And once you learn that, then you can be much more ambitious. Do you uh, uh, have any slightest thought that there is any life form on the moon? I think it's very unlikely. There's a much greater possibility that there may be the complex organic compounds which were the precursors of life. These may exist on the moon, perhaps a, a few feet down beneath the surface. But it's possible there are life forms that exist there. We think that there are uh, life forms on Earth which might survive if they got to the moon. So if the moon's uh, climate was ever more benign than it is now, say a few billion years ago, and if life ever got started there, or if it got splashed off from Earth onto the moon by meteorites that hit the Earth and sort of splashed bits of our oceans onto the moon, then it may still have survived a few feet underground where the temperature is not too extreme and where there may be moisture and chemicals necessary for life. It's unlikely, but it's possible.